We're going to mix things up just a little bit this evening. Uh, usually we, we launch right into our, uh, our screen share and our slideshow. Um, but I wanted to show you an artifact. We're going to start with some artifacts. We're going to end with some artifacts. Uh, this first one pertains to last week's column, which talked about the woodpecker skull, the amazing engineering feat that is the woodpecker skull. Now, there is uh, some slight variation between species, uh, primarily in size. <laughs> We've got our little downies and we go all the way up to our big pileated woodpeckers. Um, but they're, uh, all of the, the woodpeckers in our area, in fact, all the woodpeckers everywhere are, um, oh, yeah, we've got some company. This is number one pup, uh, Joey, stop by to say hi. Um, all woodpeckers are adapted to their uh, job, which is to knock on wood. <laughs> they do it uh, to find food, they do it to make their homes, they do it to find their mates. Uh, in fact, just today I was listening to some drumming. I still can't differentiate between species. Some people have really good ears and they can detect the difference in the, um, the speed of the drumming and the, um, the length of the drumming and they can say, aha, that's a red-bellied woodpecker. I knew I was listening to a red-bellied woodpecker uh, when I wrote the column because I saw him. <laughs> but um, uh, that's a, a whole art in and unto itself. But uh, they will drum. Uh, woodpeckers do have sounds that they make, but when they're looking to attract a mate or uh, declare their territory, defend their territory, they do that through drumming. It might be uh, on a tree, it might be on a, a hollow part of a tree, so there's better resonance. It might be on something like a gutter or some flashing. Uh, I watched a video once of a woodpecker that was drumming on the guardrail of a highway. Talk about uh, resonance there. Uh, well, they're, they're able to do that and not turn their little brains to mush because of how their skulls are adapted to this task. Now, uh, what I have here, and I'm gonna move this up here to the camera so you can see I'm going to try and watch what I'm doing I want you to look first of all at the back of the skull I think if I hold it there is that in focus um, you're gonna see there's uh, some little they look like uh, tendons um, or little strings actually can you see that Let's see if I hold that oh, maybe I'm better if I sit down and do it <laughs> um, <laughs> Tech support puppy almost ate this visual aid right before the camera came on. They're very interested. This is actually, uh, this is a skull of a flicker. I know this because uh, the gentleman who found it, he was afraid to touch it. It was actually right by the wheel of his car um, out, that was parked out in front of Hickory Knolls. He, he came in and he said, um, there's an animal head, uh, the head of an animal by my, my, the wheel of my car. Um, and there were still some feathers on it when I picked it up. There was a little bit on uh, the back of the head. There was enough for us to identify this as a flicker. Uh, but this, what I want you to look at here is, um, uh, let's see, is that going to focus that close in or not? Um, maybe this isn't going to work as well as I thought. <laughs> um, let me try a little bit. Uh, it just seems to get fuzzier as I bring it closer. Um, well, here, that actually shows the groove. That, that'll work. The groove on the top of the skull is the channel uh, through which the ends um, of this amazing apparatus on the woodpecker's head, it goes all the way uh, through the, the back of the skull, up across the top, and up into one of the nostrils. That's what uh, let's the woodpecker's tongue go in and out and it also uh, helps the bird um, absorb some of that shock that it sustains as it is banging its way into a tree. Look at the size of this bill too by the way. This, so this again this is the uh, the northern flicker and um, it's just really so exquisitely adapted. Uh, besides that, that hyoid uh, apparatus, which we have a, a much reduced version of this in our heads. Um, 
right above where our Adam's apple is, there's a, a little a bony structure. I don't believe it's attached to anything. Dr. Sarah, you can maybe explain it better than I can, but it, it helps support our, our tongue. Um, and the woodpecker, it um, also helps keep things together during that business of all the, uh, the wrapping and knocking that they are able to do. Uh, this, uh, this skull has um, developed over millennia into a, a really astounding structure that saves the woodpecker from brain damage given that it has to slam its head uh, against the tree in order to be able to survive. Um, it's also served as uh, inspiration for some human apparatus, which we're going to take a look at here. With that, I think I'll go ahead and get the screen share started and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about woodpecker brains. Let's let get this started here. <laughs> let's get this started here. There's the right screen. All right, let's optimize it and uh, let's get going. There's some good news. Um, another uh, part of the woodpecker's skull that saves it from certain brain damage is um, the way the, uh, the interior of the skull, the, the way the brain is packed inside. Uh, it's surrounded by uh, some spongy material, uh, or the, the, the bones themselves are made to, uh, to help absorb the impact as um, the woodpecker is hitting its head against uh, the tree. Now, uh, some enterprising engineers took a look at this structure and they said, you know what? Humans have a tendency to slam their heads, usually not on purpose, but maybe there's a way we can use what's going on in a woodpecker's skull to uh, help save some human lives. And so uh, they came up with this design here. This is a bicycle helmet that's called a cranium. Um, it gives you a look into the inside uh, of the, uh, the helmet. Now, uh, a typical bike helmet has a, a poly, I don't know if it's polystyrene or polycarbonate materials put together for the hard exterior and the softer <laughs> interior. So should you be riding your bicycle and hit something hard with your head, um, the skull, uh, the uh, helmet can help absorb some of that impact so your skull doesn't have to take the brunt of it. So what these engineers did was they took that idea and they took um, corrugated cardboard. Um, they made sure to waterproof it so that uh, if the helmet were to get wet, whether the rider were to fall in water or whether the rider were to just be sweating a lot. But um, the, the cardboard uh, had to withstand, I think it was um, several days of submersion so it's, it's uh, been waterproofed, coated, so that it, uh, it won't get soft and soggy. And it will uh, take on, uh, just as the woodpecker's skull absorbs the brunt of the impact um, on its head, this helmet would absorb the impact um, should a rider go down. Now, um, I can't attest to uh, if this works or not. I actually toyed with the idea of buying one. I went online. This, um, this uh, helmet was developed over several years, uh, starting about uh, 10 years ago or so. And it went on the market maybe five years ago. Um, you can still buy them, but they've been marked down dramatically. This is a, a UK site that deals in the uh, cranium helmets. Um, they've been on sale for quite a while, and you can see they still have more than five available. <laughs> um, some of the reviews took into account the actual uh, human comfort factor of wearing uh, what's a modified woodpecker skull on your head. Uh, the users noted that uh, there's not a lot of, um, oh, hold on just a minute, <laughs> tech support puppy has grabbed one of the visual aids here, hold on. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
that, folks. <laughs> One of the hazards of having furry roommates. Um, I'm just going to put this out of weight, and I will put the rest of it on my lap. Uh, so anyway, the, the people who bought these cranium helmets um, noted that there's just one small vent. So heat tends to build up inside of this uh, ultra-protective uh, helmet designed on <laughs> the basis of a woodpecker skull. They also noted that it was kind of heavy. So, um, you know, humans, there's a, there's a lot of instances uh, in, over time where humans have used inspiration from nature. This, I think it, it might still have merit, but I, I believe another engineer needs to get a hold of this design and maybe adapt a few more materials so that it actually does become usable for human beings. <laughs> Um, now, let's move on to another uh, way that perhaps a woodpecker skull adaptation helps save a life. Uh, Dorothy, this uh, email was from you from, um, oh gosh, close to a month ago already. Uh, Dorothy actually sent me this little note as I was writing the column about woodpecker skulls. Uh, this little downy woodpecker uh, flew into the uh, sliding door at Dorothy's house. And um, it got dinged, but I couldn't help but wonder if all of the adaptations inside the skull actually saved this bird from greater harm. Uh, Dorothy, you're 100% correct. It is a downy woodpecker, and we'll say female downy due to the lack of red on the back of the head. Now, downy woodpeckers are our smallest woodpecker. They're also... Uh, I dare say our most common woodpecker. They have the um, the luxury of being able to forage both in uh, grassy areas. They're small enough they can land on the stems of some of our wildflowers. They can peck open the gall of a goldenrod um, and a goldenrod stem. They can uh, pluck the seeds out of a, a echinacea seed head. Uh, and they can also uh, fly into the woods and uh, pound open an acorn. So they've got their sort of dual residency status amongst uh, both uh, savanna or grassy areas and also our woodlands. Now, besides that, um, they, uh, so they, they're, they're seen in our neighborhoods. They come to uh, bird feeders. Uh, they'll feed at our, our suet and they'll crack open seeds. Um, you can tell a downy from its very uh, similar cousin, the hairy woodpecker, by this small bill. See how the, the bill on this bird, even though it does a good job of uh, pecking open seeds and it can also um, excavate a cavity in a tree, it's um, about half uh, the, the depth of the head. Uh, the head and the bill uh, usually are connected <laughs> um, unless something dreadful has happened. They're going to be side by side and the skull provides a great means of measuring uh, the size of the bill. On a hairy woodpecker, the bill is going to be much longer uh, in relation to the head, though the markings uh, will be similar. So Dorothy's story has a happy ending. Uh, she and her cat Daisy were able to, to get this, uh, watch this bird uh, very closely and um, after about uh, 20 minutes or so, um, Dorothy reached out, um, touched the bird very lightly, and off she flew into the woods. So let's give this one, let's chalk this one up to the, uh, <clears throat> the efficiency and the exquisite adaptation that is the woodpecker skull. All right, with that, let's move on. Uh, we're going to stay in the general head region for another couple of slides. Uh, I got an email. Uh, from my friend Chuck. Uh, it was rather short in nature. It was this picture and it asked, is this the lower jaw of an opossum? It has strange teeth. And you'll see it does this, the teeth do look rather pointy. Uh, let's see, there's one, two, looks like three, four, five teeth here. And then the jaw is broken off. Um, I looked at that and I thought, oh, you know, I don't think it's an opossum. I'm pretty sure that it's a deer. Uh, now, there's nothing here to give us a real good measure. There's no <clears throat> lip balm there to, to let us know, you know, how it relates to something that's two and five eighths inches long. But um, if you look at uh, some of the surrounding materials, there's some what looks like part of a, an oak leaf there towards the bottom. Um, 
And there's there's enough there that this this seemed larger than what we would see on an opossum. But um, I thought you might like to just for comparison's sake uh, see what uh, an opossum jaw and also a wood um, I'm sorry a raccoon jaw look like. So on the uh, the left side of the screen there in the foreground is an opossum jaw with a few teeth missing and behind that is the lower jaw uh, half of the lower jaw of a raccoon i would say uh, of all the skulls that are um, either emailed photos of or are actually brought to hickory knolls for identification nine out of ten of them are raccoon skulls i don't know if it's just that we have that many raccoons or if we have that many raccoons that happen to die in places where people will find their skulls. Um, I, I know our raccoon population is fairly robust, but um, we, we see a lot of these. We don't see very many opossum skulls. Um, now the teeth, uh, if we look in even closer at the teeth of an opossum, they are, um, as Chuck, they, they, uh, they're strange looking. They've got multiple points on the molars, um, they, they give the impression of being ragged or jagged. Uh, the raccoon uh, molars are in the background there. You can see uh, they are more rounded. Now, teeth do wear with age, but the opossum teeth, even an old opossum will have these very uh, jagged, um, very uh, sort of formidable looking teeth. Now, the, uh, the deer in the right-hand photo, the points on those teeth are still um, pretty, uh, pretty prominent. That leads me to believe that maybe that was a younger deer. Uh, as a deer, when uh, deer hunters, when they bring their deer uh, into check stations, it's the teeth that are used to uh, estimate the age of the deer. Um, so uh, the, the, the bigger the tooth, the less ground down it is, the more prominent those points are, the uh, younger it's assumed that the deer is. Uh, it's the same with our other mammals, um, the, the, the raccoons, the opossums, um, the uh, more uh, pointy the teeth are, generally speaking, the younger the animal. Now, um, I'm gonna go back just a second. So in this photo, the opossum jaw that's in the foreground it looks smaller than the raccoon uh, jaw that's in the background, and it was. The reason, though, isn't that opossum jaws are always smaller than raccoons. Uh, I think this was uh, the opossum jaw was from a younger individual, uh, and the uh, the raccoon jaw was from a mature animal. Now, um, I also took some pictures of the skulls <clears throat> from the top view and uh, the kind of the upside down view of the raccoon and the uh, opossum. Opossums have this, this uh, well, uh, a crest or a ridge that goes uh, across the back part uh, where the, like where the brain case of the skull would be. That's called the sagittal crest. And that's where uh, muscles attach. Uh, opossums have pretty uh, strong Jaws. Opossums also have the distinction of having more teeth than any other North American mammal. They have 50 teeth. Now, are you going to find uh, an intact skull with both the upper and the lower jaws? And are all the teeth going to be there? Probably not. But um, if you if you find one, even if uh, some of the teeth are missing, you can like as you see on the uh, the raccoon skull, which is the one in the the upper part of the photos. Um, you can see where teeth used to plug in. It can get tricky up at the front where the incisors are because um, a lot of times those are missing and sometimes even the sockets are kind of broken up. But um, that's where it's handy to know what the dental formula of our local mammals are. Um, oh, before we get to that, I, I did want to point out one other thing on the raccoon skull. Uh, which is on the uh, upper part of the left-hand uh, photo. Can you see how it looks like something chewed on it? Well, something did chew on it. Skulls, uh, I always try to, I, I try to curb my own instinct to, to pick up every skull I see. Uh, I encourage other people to do the same. A, a picture oftentimes is just as good. And uh, these uh, skulls and, um, well, 
other bones as well. They provide an important source of calcium for a lot of other creatures. A lot of our rodents um, and rabbits too will chew on these to get extra calcium uh, for their own teeth and bones. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, getting back to the, the dental formula, um, if you look in uh, the back, uh, like the Peterson Guide to Mammals, there's a um, several pages of animal skulls that also feature dental formulas. If you know how to read those, um, you can apply that to the skulls that you see. Um, mammologists oftentimes have these things committed to memory. I usually have to look them up, although uh, a possum is easy because they have 50 teeth and that's more than any other one. Um, and raccoons have uh, 40, which um, it's 10 less than 50, <laughs> and we see a lot of raccoon skulls, so I, I remind myself of that. Now, um, coyotes, they have 42 teeth, and so do domestic dogs. Now, um, around here, we don't tend to have a lot of stray dogs that, uh, you know, end up dying and, and leaving their skulls out to be found. Usually, if you find uh, a canine skull, it'll be either a coyote or a fox. Um, but the, the coyote and the dog do have 42 teeth. Um, can't offhand recall what the fox, if they have the same dental formula or not. Um, you'll notice white-tailed deer, they only have 34 teeth. They don't have any upper incisors. Um, they, on the lower jaw, they do have incisors across um, uh, the bottom front of their uh, lower jaws, but um, nothing up on the top. That accounts for why uh, when we find uh, deer brows, it's it's a kind of a, a frayed looking. It's not a it's not a concise um, chomp like we see with uh, say a, a, a rabbit that will uh, chew something off with its sharp uh, incisors. A deer will bite down, but then they have to pull and it kind of tears the top of the plant or the twigs, so it leaves a, a frayed looking appearance. Um, it's because of that lack of upper incisors. Um, so I, on this formula, I is incisor, C is canine, P is premolar, and M is molar. And the way those, uh, those numbers, uh, like say if we look at the raccoon, it says I3-3, uh, on the top and 3-3 below. So that means um, you divide the, the mouth in half. In fact, in the lower jaw, the lower jaw is in two pieces anyway, but um, there'll be three on one side and three on the other, uh, both top and bottom. So that's a total of 12 incisors for our raccoon. Uh, the opossum, you'll see, it has a different number of incisors on the top versus the bottom. It has 10 incisors on the top and eight on the bottom. It's a lot of chompers. <laughs> um, and then uh, canines, pretty much all animals, they just have one on either side, top and bottom. Uh, premolars and then the molars. Um, again, when you add up for the opossum, you end up with 26 teeth on the top, 24 on the bottom. Either way, that's a lot of jagged, raggedy teeth um, staring back at you. And again, if you do find a skull, look for that crest. It's very prominent and it's a dead giveaway. Um, if tech support puppy doesn't eat it, we'll look at an actual opossum skull when we're done uh, with the, uh, the screen share. So um, I got an email from my friend Paul and he said, hey, look who I went to see last Saturday, the Biddle Stag Moose. So um, this is a, a local curiosity that, that uh, comes to light from time to time. It's actually a, a relic from the last ice age. Uh, it was found out on the Biddle Farm, which um, Kim, I think you're tuned in this evening. Uh, this, the Biddle Farm is out uh, uh, on the far uh, west end of Campton Hills Road in uh, Campton Township. Biddle Farm is, is quite large. Uh, I believe they were excavating um, an extra watering hole for their cattle. I think that's the story of how they came upon these large bones. Well, they, they thought they were pretty cool, so they hung them up in the barn at the Biddle Farm. And it, it wasn't, um, for several years, uh, there was a uh, scientist, I believe it was a member of the Illinois uh, Geologic Survey, came along. Uh, happened to notice these bones and identified them 
uh, as a stag moose. Uh, at that time, then, they were donated to the Illinois State Museum down in Springfield. Now, um, here's the uh, picture Paul took of the, the plaque that's in front of these, uh, these bones. Uh, Illinois State Museum offers some, us some more information about these really cool animals. Um, is it a stag? Is it a moose? Uh, they believe that these animals uh, measured out to be slightly larger than our uh, modern day moose. Um, they kind of have qualities of a moose and an elk. Uh, they tend to be found in areas that have deposits uh, of, that were uh, wetland in nature. Uh, back during the Ice Age, we had uh, a lot of spruce trees in this area, so uh, wet areas where spruce trees grow. Uh, basically where modern day moose like to hang out. Um, that's the way the climate was um, here in Illinois back during the Ice Age. That map there on the right, uh, all those green points show different places where stag moose uh, remains have been found. Some of them date back a mere 11,000 years and other ones are more like 40,000 years old. Um, Illinois State Museum folks say this isn't a terribly common um, Ice Age mammal to be found. There's There's been you know, several discoveries, but uh, mastodons, mammoths, um, the Ice Age mammals that we tend to hear a lot about uh, we do because they're more common than uh, this stag moose. But I thought it was kind of cool, and if you happen to find yourself out and about um, touring museums, uh, see if you too can find uh, some stag moose uh, remains, learn a little bit about this really neat animal from our uh, most recent Ice Age. Now this was a, a cool photo. Uh, that a uh, local gentleman sent in. Uh, again, a brief email. He just said it was hunting squirrels on its back deck. And he pointed out this fox does not have a tail. Now, let's look for just a, a, a minute at the adaptations that uh, red foxes have to survive our cold winter weather. Uh, look at those ears, lined with fur. They got fur on the back, they got fur on the inside. It's great protection for cold winter days. Uh, the, the face is fully furred, the feet are fully furred. Um, compare that to what you might uh, see on, uh, say, an opossum, which I think is our area's most poorly adapted mammal for winter weather. Opossums have bare ears, they have bare feet, they have a bare tail. Um, now, one thing I've, I've always heard and uh, have seen a time or two uh, is how important the fox's tail is um, to its winter survival. Uh, I did find this picture of a fox curled up on the ice. Look at how that tail functions uh, as kind of a, a blanket to snuggle into. You can see how the one bare part of the fox's face, its nose, uh, it can bury it into that thick fur on the tail. And uh, it can be protected from uh, the cold temperatures and the wind. So this, uh, this fox, uh, it certainly looks healthy. It doesn't look um, like it's uh, suffering a whole lot. Now, granted, our, our uh, winter temperatures this year were overall uh, fairly warm. I know we did have some cold days, but overall um, the, the winter temperatures were, were a little bit kinder to us this year. Uh, anyway, this fox, though, I, I would love to know what happened to the tail. Was it, did it get caught in something, you know, some sort of human, we humans, you know, we have a tendency to leave all kinds of hazardous things laying around. I know um, you know, I've seen uh, different areas, uh, even on our own Hickory Knolls natural area, um, we've got still got some, some junk piles remaining there where there's coils of barbed wire, there's there's you know jagged pieces of metal. Could have been something like that. It might have been a, you know, a fight. Um, coyotes do uh, defend their territory from lots of different animals, including foxes. In fact, they want to shoo the foxes away from their territory, so maybe there was some sort of a skirmish that way. Um, I don't know what happened to the tail, but uh, I figured this, this fox doesn't, it's lacking one major uh, adaptation, but uh, the rest of it, the, the, the thick fur um, throughout the rest of the body, it seems to be doing just fine. But 
kind of a cool picture. Not exactly sure where this fox lives, but um, I'll be keeping my eye open for it in case it is a local one. Um, last week, and we've, we've all, uh, even though our, our winter was fairly mild, I think we are pretty hungry for signs of spring. And last week I did mention that the sap was running. Well, um, we've gone into syrup production mode here at uh, Casa Otto, and um, that includes uh, collecting the sap here from uh, the silver maple we have in the backyard. Now, I have to say, this isn't at all what you would see in a, a commercial uh, syrup producing region. Uh, I've got my spile that I made out of the elderberry twig. Uh, it's dripping into a food grade bucket that I have a, a lid loosely attached with a heavy rock to weight it down. Uh, it gets even less professional uh, when we look at the collection methods. I found all the jars and jugs <laughs> that I could find to help haul the syrup in. And yes, I did get an assist um, for better or for worse from tech support puppy. Turns out dogs really like the sweet sap from uh, these. Uh, this is again, this is a silver maple, not a sugar maple. But you know, I was I was really pleased with the sugar content. Uh, when we talk about getting sap from a maple tree and turning it into syrup, the often quoted figure that you'll hear for a sugar maple is you need 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So 40 to 1 uh, ratio. Um, when I boiled my first batch of syrup, and the, the first day that I had it out there, um, I only collected uh, what amounted to four cups. So there's 16 tablespoons in a cup. Four cups would be 64 tablespoons of sap. Uh, I boiled that down and I ended up with two tablespoons of syrup. So. Um, and I have collected quite a bit. In fact, I'm going to boil some more tonight. But um, that was a 1 to 32 ratio, which I thought was pretty good. And the, the, the sugar um, is, I think the, the syrup tastes, uh, tastes really good. Um, I think it's comparable to what you would pull out of a sugar maple. I uh, can't remember if I mentioned this last week or not, but uh, the scientific name for the sugar maple is Acer saccharum, so the maple with the sugar in it. Um, the scientific name for the silver maple is Acer saccharinum, or the maple with the little sugar in it. And by that uh, scientific name doesn't necessarily mean it, does, it just has a little bit of sugar. It means the grain of the sugar, the size of the sugar or carbohydrate molecules is, uh, is uh, fairly small. So, uh, I, yeah, I think it makes a, a fine syrup. In fact, um, <laughs> it was also attractive, not just to me and tech support puppy, but to this, uh, this little spider. You never know what you're gonna find if you don't have a tight fitting lid on your sap collecting buckets. This was um, a spider that was in the bucket uh, when I pulled the sap in on Sunday. This is, I believe it's a wandering crab spider. Um, this is actually the spider, which by the way, did not survive its bath in the sap. Um, it's laying on its back at the bottom of the bucket. And uh, I thought it was kind of a, a cool picture because it shows the very prominent, uh, what I always refer to as the boxing gloves up there at the front. So we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight legs, but then there's those two structures up by the head. Those are the, the petty palps. And then at the end of the palps, there are those, um, those are actually the, the reproductive structures of the male spider. So this was a male uh, running crab spider. Uh, and again, it ran, ran right into the bucket. And uh, it's, uh, well, I, I did filter it out. I'm not going to make spider syrup out of it. I, I filtered it as I was pouring it uh, into the vat to be boiled. But anyway, you never know what you're going to find when you're collecting sap like that. Um, and you know what? It all turned out for the best. I had a, a heaping pile of uh, French toast for breakfast on Sunday morning with uh, the sap that uh, I had been boiled down. Boiled down so far, I ended up with uh, that jar, I think... Um, 
held like 17, it was a, a different amount, I think 16 or 17 ounces uh, of syrup. I've still got um, about three more gallons to boil down. So might be another late night of syrup making, but it should be going on a little bit longer. This week actually looks pretty good uh, for sap uh, to be running. To get that pressure uh, change within the tree's vessels, having nights that are below freezing combined with days that are above freezing, uh, get things going up. And of course, the sap's purpose isn't uh, just to for us to collect to put on our uh, French toast and our pancakes. It's there to help the tree uh, nourish its buds so that they can open up and the tree can get its leaves and it can make food uh, that will uh, ultimately wind up um, creating the sugar that we'll collect in next year's uh, sap run. So ah, anyway, that was just uh, kind of an exciting thing. One other thing that I don't think, no, I didn't get a picture and I'm gonna stop the screen share, but you know what, signs of spring are coming fast and furious. Today I saw um, several pairs of geese. Now at night, our Canada geese, they're still going back to uh, the river. Uh, or if there's open ponds, there's, they're still gathering in flocks that way. But there are, are migratory flocks. They are taking off and heading north. The resident flocks that are staying here, you'll notice a difference in the daytime behavior uh, uh, between mated pairs. Uh, they are starting to go. This is what I, I call the, uh, the dating um, portion of the mating season. I was watching a pair today. Uh, she was very busily pulling up lots of grass and he was standing there vigilantly watching making sure nobody got in her way um, watch for that behavior um, we'll talk about more signs of spring as we get into next week now um let's see i'm going to try showing you some of these uh, artifacts again let me get the uh, the possum skull out here so you can see i'm going to see if i can get the camera to focus on it and also uh, keep tech support puppy from uh, eating it. So you can get a look at that sagittal crest, lest you find an opossum skull of your very own. Okay, I'm gonna hold it up here. Um, let's see if I can get the lighting right on it. Um, so, ah, there, that's good. See that, that strong ridge on the top? Uh, so that would be the back of the skull. Um, Something else kind of curious about uh, opossums, they have a really tiny brain case. Um, if we compare that with the, and again, these were smaller animals. This was a younger opossum. This was a mature raccoon. But uh, look at the difference in the size of where the brain sits in the skull. Um, tiny brain case, but um, nonetheless, extremely useful animals to have around the opossum and raccoons too. Who doesn't love a good trash panda? Now, um, I did bring this bag home because I noticed I was getting quite a collection of little things on my desk that I thought you guys might find interesting. I was walking to work uh, one day last week and I noticed there were a whole lot of these on the ground. Uh, this was over at uh, Baker Field Park, which is here in St. Charles. You don't see these trees too much um, in this uh, area. This is a, a tree we see as we go farther downstate and certainly in more of our southern states. This is a, a sweet gum tree. Um, I remember I was taking a drawing class when I was at U of I and our teacher uh, had told us that we needed to bring in some objects from nature to draw in class. And I, of course, completely forgot about the assignment until I was walking into the armory. Well, outside of the armory, there are, uh, in uh, Champaign, there are uh, a few sweet gum trees uh, growing there. So I, I got to be intimately familiar with the uh, seeds, uh, seed cases of the sweet gum as I drew them for that class. But uh, cool trees, I was wondering, you know, if people were to plant sweet gums in this area, how well do they do? There are um, cultivars of sweet gum that are, have been bred to, to be more adapted to our, uh, we're in uh, US, uh, we're in zone five in terms of plant hardiness. 
um, the numbers get smaller as you go farther north and they get higher as you go farther south. They go all the way up to zone, I think, nine. So we're in zone five, which is pretty much right in the middle. Uh, but I was noticing that, that some of our local nurseries um, carry sweet gum and they just, the, the buying notes say that, you know, as long as the, uh, the tree has been grown in this climate, it, it's uh, you know, proven that it, it can grow here. Um, go ahead and, and plant one. If you bring one up from down south, it might not survive. But if you buy one that is growing in this region, um, it should do fine. Uh, it, um, I always try to look for straight species whenever I'm buying a plant, uh, not a cultivar. Cultivars sometimes are uh, they're bred for certain qualities, um, they, you know, something like cold hardiness, but also uh, you know, disease resistance and things like that. Uh, that doesn't always mean that it's going to do the job that our uh, local wildlife needs it to do. Our local pollinators might need a quality that's been bred out through that um, cultivation. But anyway, uh, look for sweet gums. Uh, they are around in different places. As I said, this one is here in St. Charles at Bakerfield Park. But cool plants and cool seed cases. Now, um, I found another on a walk a couple of weeks ago. Let me pull these out. Um, Susie, this will look familiar to you. These are the uh, seeds uh, cases of a, I don't know if you'd call it a, a shrub. I think it's more of a shrub than a small tree. It, it's got a multi-stem growth habit to it. Um, this is a bladder nut tree or shrub. Uh, this is the seed uh, case of this really cool, uh, they, they, this is a, a tree that the first time I ever saw one, I was actually, I was up in Wisconsin and I, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a tree full of cocoons. And uh, I walked over to it and I touched it. They even kind of feel um, you know, like they could be uh, a leaf strung together with, um, you know, held together with, with silk, that there might be a caterpillar in here. But no, especially when you see a whole tree full of them, it couldn't possibly be that many silk moths making cocoons like that. But um, this is a, uh, a um, American bladder nut. There's also a European bladder nut that has some folklore associated with it. I was hoping that maybe there was American folklore that was similar in, in Europe. Uh, in Poland specifically, they talked about um, harvesting the seeds of the bladder nut and using them to make uh, rosary beads. Um, I did come across a, a foraging site though that said that the seeds of the bladder nut uh, actually taste like pistachios. So I thought it might be kind of fun uh, to try one, you guys as my witness, um, maybe somebody could dial a nine and a one. So if this goes wrong, um, you only have one more number <laughs> to dial. All right, so here's the little seed. It actually looks kind of like a popcorn kernel. I can see why we don't make rosaries out of American bladder nut seeds. Can you see how tiny that seed is? It looks like a, a kernel of popcorn. All right, I'm going to give this a try, see if it tastes like uh, pistachio. All right. Huh. <laughs> I tell you, you know what? It doesn't taste like anything, but it feels like I'm going to break a tooth if I bite down any harder. Um, all right, I'm going to be a little indelicate here for a minute. All right, so that didn't work out so well. Um, but uh, this is a, a, a tree that is adapted to this climate. It does like, um, like you said, we saw these uh, uh, bladder nuts were growing along the Fox River. I know uh, of some yards that have bladder nuts in them uh, along the parkway. So uh, it might be something, if you're looking for a, a, a tree or a shrub with a spreading growth habit, you might want to consider this cool little native uh, plant called the American bladder nut. All right, I got some more fun things in the bag here. Tech support puppy did not succeed in eating everything. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Or did he? <laughs> oh, nope, here it is. Um, what I'm looking for is the, the praying mantis uh, egg cases that are very obvious right now. Here's the stick that it was on. Let me see. Well, well it, <laughs> it might be gone, um, which is fine. The, the, uh, if you find a praying mantis, uh, okay, so what, what I was going to show you looked um, kind of like a, um, a toasted marshmallow. Uh, this one happened to be on a uh, goldenrod stem. Toasted marshmallow size piece. They also, uh, some people say they look like the uh, expanding foam that you see, uh, you know, like you'd use, you'd spray around uh, a window or uh, inside of a door frame to uh, help keep the cold drafts out. Um, they tend to be uh, about that big in size. And um, they, we do not have um, native praying mantis in northern Illinois. The, the Carolina mantis would be the species that's native to Illinois, but they occur a little bit farther south from here. What we have in this area is the uh, the Chinese mantis and the European mantis. So um, anytime you see one of those egg cases, I always counsel or advise people to, to bring them inside. They A praying mantis makes a fun little pet. Um, and uh, if, if you don't want to uh, keep them as pets, um, you can, um, this is gonna sound cruel, but if you, you throw them in a, in a fire or something and destroy them because there is some concern that these uh, Chinese mantids, they get quite large and um, they, they do have an effect on our local food chains. Uh, they, some places they, uh, take the place of spiders. In fact, they even eat spiders. There uh, was a, uh, a record of uh, a praying mantis uh, eating uh, baby snakes, baby mice, and also um, there's a, that uh, one image that made the, the rounds on the internet a few years ago was a, a Chinese mantis eating a hummingbird. So um, again, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tech support puppy ate my visual aid for that one, but um, uh, if I find another one, I will be sure and, uh, and let you see it because this is the time of year uh, before the uh, foliage comes out again. Uh, you want to be on the lookout for those and, and collect them if you can. Um, well, gee, the last thing I had is, is right here. This was, um, this was the spile that I used to tap the maple tree with, uh, we just cut a length of elderberry. Um, the pith that would be in the center of the stem comes out real easily. I just, I took a, a drill bit, it wasn't attached to the drill, I just um, pushed it, the, the, the pith of the elderberry is, is very soft, uh, kind of spongy almost, and um, I just twisted the bit through and uh, cleared this out. and. Um, had a ready-made spile. The advantage of using an elderberry spile over, say, uh, a commercially made one, uh, an aluminum one, is that you can make a much smaller hole. So uh, even though a tree can withstand having uh, up to about a half inch size uh, hole drilled in it, the smaller the better. Uh, this goes in, comes out easily, and um, it's biodegradable. So uh, with that, um, Boy, I wish that uh, egg case would turn up, but I think it's gone. Thanks, Boker. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you folks. Does anybody have any, uh, any questions, any um, things they might have seen over the past week, any local curiosities or signs of spring that you'd like to share with the group? Hey, hey Pam. I, I just, um, my, uh, Carrie told me that uh, sumac spiles work pretty well, too. Oh, yes, I've heard that. Um, and sumac is another um, 
pretty pretty common uh, small tree or, or large shrub in the area. It also has a soft pith. Um, so that's, yeah, that's good to know. I, I just, I was um, emailing with a gentleman earlier this week who said that he, he wanted to try maple tapping for the first time. He said, but he needed to get to a store where he could buy some supplies. He thought maybe Farm and Fleet would have them. And that's when I told him about using um, a, uh, a twig like this. I'll, I'll uh, email him back and let him know about the sumac too. Uh, thanks, Kim, that's a great idea. I was going to say, Carrie also told me that Farm and Fleet does indeed have kits for maple, oh. maple, maple sugar. So great, yeah. So there you go. Um, so you know, I'm. Uh, what would be a nice word? Not frugal. Let's call me frugal. <laughs> um, so I, uh, you know, the bucket I was using was we had, uh, had a donation at the Nature Center years ago of several. Um, food grade buckets that smelled like pickles. Uh, we use them for animal care, but this one had been set aside and it, it one, it wasn't used for anything, and two, it didn't smell like pickles anymore. So I um, adopted this one. Um, actually, last year I used it for maple tapping as well. I've heard that um, Jewel, I know when I worked at, at Red Oak, we used to get uh, bakery uh, buckets from the the bakery at Jewel. They get um, a lot of batters and frostings in uh, food grade buckets that they're oftentimes uh, anxious to get rid of. Uh, Harner's Bakery down in North Aurora, they uh, have buckets for sale for, I don't know, a dollar or two. So as long as it's it's not, you know, you don't want to use the one that you got your uh, driveway uh, seal coating <laughs> material in um, or you know paint something like that but you know if, if it had food in it before as long as it doesn't smell uh, like that food you know like pickles or olives or something it, it should work out just fine um, now you can um, if you uh, put a hook on your tree um, I didn't want to hang the bucket off of the, the, it wouldn't have worked to hang a uh, heavy bucket off of a uh, elderberry spile. So I just kind of leaned it up against the tree. But if you um, uh, attach a tube to your spile, a, a length of um, plastic tubing, and you put the cover fully on the bucket and cut a hole in it for the tube, that's going to keep out uh, a lot of uh, detritus, <laughs> a lot of spiders <laughs> from your sap, too. Um, Pam, what's the, um, this is Diane, what, what's the best way to, or the safest and most conscientious way to make the hole in the tree? Um, you know, Diane, I just used um, my drill and I used, um, oh gosh, was it, um, uh, let's see, three eighths inch bit? Um, it, it was, I matched the size of the bit to the size of the spile. Um, if you buy a kit, it's going to tell you what size that you need to, to drill. Um, I went in uh, an inch and a half, and then I tapped the spile in uh, three quarters of an inch. I used, um, I used a marker, I used a Sharpie to mark on my drill bit so I didn't go you know, in as deep as the bit would go. Um, so I, I made sure I, I stopped at one and a half inches. And then when I, I tapped this in, I used a, a rubber mallet and I had marked on here where three quarters of an inch was. Um, and it, I tell you, boy, it's, it's, it's just so cool to see the sap come dripping out. Now, mm -hmm. there were a couple of days last week where there was no sap. And I began to think, oh gosh, did my tree you know, heal up that quickly? Did it close off? and? Do I need to make another hole? And it was just because we didn't have uh, the temperature gradient that we needed. It didn't get below freezing overnight. So there were a couple of days last week where um, there uh, there was no sap flow. This week, like I said, I, I think um, the, the difference between nighttime and daytime temperatures is going to be just right. I think this would be a good week to get some sap if you're so inclined. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, I just have to keep keep going since I just Please. did tap just did 
the maple sugaring this weekend, there are there's a list that you can go online. There's 27 different trees you can tap too. So it's not just maples. You can actually tap other trees as well can, if you have them in your backyard. <laughs> I am so glad you said that because um, so at Hickory Knolls we are going to try uh, our first ever maple tapping program. Uh, I'd sort of avoided the topic um, as, as a programming uh, subject just because you know, we're 1.7 miles from Creek Bend Nature Center and the Forest Preserve District has had a long-standing tradition of hosting maple sugaring events. So um, I had thought if we were going to do it that maybe we should do um, black walnut is actually, um, mm -hmm. I think it makes a phenomenal syrup. If I had the trees that were big enough uh, in my yard to make uh, walnut syrup by wood. Um, I just happen to have the silver maple, but yeah, you can make, uh, I believe the birch uh, sap, that runs a little bit behind uh, the maple timetable. Mm -hmm. it, I've uh, heard, and I've not tried this, I do have a sort of a, a sickly birch out in front uh, of my house that I've toyed with the idea of tapping, but um, it was a, a three-trunked birch, and two of those trunks have died and fallen over, and I, I really don't want the third one to die and fall on my driveway, so I'm a little reluctant to punch a hole in it. Um, well, and it's also it's also about 120 to 1 versus 40 to 1. Wow. So, and, and, and I, I just and I just read this weekend, too. I'm sorry. I'm just No, no, it. please. But... Uh, uh, a person came by and said he had anyway he had tapped in and it tasted funny. They finally used it as salad dressing. And then I I thought, well, I'm always glad when people ask me questions I don't know because I looked it up in birch syrup. Even though it's like 120 to one, it tends to ferment very quickly. So you have to use that syrup really fast. Oh. All right, I'll stop now. No, but that's <laughs> Kim. What is it? Does birch? Because um, I've heard. Uh, you know that you can you can chew on um, birch twigs and they taste like wintergreen. Did do you have any oh. indication of what the birch sap <laughs> tastes like? No, it, it's evidently a little spicier of some sort because the man who tapped who he actually he bought it. They were in Quebec province and they bought it and uh, they thought it tasted okay. But then his mother came over and said, Oh, this is funny. So it, it, they like they used it as salad dressing and it was really good for that. So it's a little bit more tends towards a, more, a little more vinegary thing okay. even before it ferments. So it's a little bit different sort of flavor. All the trees that you would tap besides maple are a little different flavor, but a savory, maybe. Yeah. Savory. <laughs> Interesting. Well, yeah, um, I know uh, basswood, um, I've heard that people will tap, but that's got a, a very high, I don't remember offhand what the ratio is, but that has a lot of water in it as well. Um, the basswood tree, you can make syrup from that. But wow, 27 different kinds. That, um, well, yeah. according to one site anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, do, I may have read do, that, yeah. that same one. Do not tap buckthorn because it's toxic. <laughs> of course. Okay. There's other things you can do to buckthorn. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, when, when we opened Hickory Knolls, I thought it might be kind of cool to have a hickory syrup. And mm. I, I looked up, because there were some places in Indiana that were selling hickory syrup, but it wasn't from the sap of the tree. It was made by peeling some of the bark mm -hmm. off and, and boiling it and getting uh, the hickory essence uh, in the, the water and then adding sugar and reducing it to make a syrup. And I thought, well, that that doesn't count. <laughs> um, I don't know, you know, because you're right, there, there's probably some trees that um, would um, make something you know, that would be good for you. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, be creative. Uh, maybe do some research uh, of your own to see uh, that that um, that site that talks about um, the 27 different trees. It is quite interesting, and I think if it's the same one that I'm thinking, if you're talking about the same one that I had read, you know, they had said that in future years they would try tapping future trees, and I don't know. Um, I haven't visited this year to see how much progress yeah. they've made on I that. Cool stuff, though. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> um, you know, uh, looking here, I did have one other thing I was going to share 
with you all tonight. Um, uh, and it pertains to uh, the column that we talked about a few weeks ago on the uh, ivory-billed woodpecker, um, a woman who lives uh, locally, actually I believe she's in Joliet, Illinois, uh, she sent that column to her brother down in Texas who was all over the uh, search for the ivory-billed woodpecker back in uh, the early 2000s. And he, he sent um, a lot of information um, about uh, the, the still going on uh, searches for the, um, the ivory-billed woodpecker. He sent me a nice photo. Um, I don't think he took it. <laughs> um, I don't know if this was handed out. There were a lot of events. Uh, there was actually uh, festivals uh, surrounding the ivory billed woodpecker. He sent me um, an article, a supplement from the newspaper about this uh, fantastic search for this bird. Um, this was, uh, I believe, in Arkansas. Um, and then he sent me a really nice letter, too, um, encouraging um, us to continue our education efforts um, and uh, alerting people to the fact that the search for the ivory build isn't over yet. Um, so that was, that was kind, of, kind of fun. Um, boy, lots and lots and lots of material. If any of you are looking to uh, learn a little bit more about the ivory build, uh, let me know because um, uh, Mr. Ron down in San Marcos, Texas sent lots and lots of ivory build information just for us. All right. Um, anybody else have anything they'd care to share? Uh, if not, I um, appreciate you spending some time with us this evening. Uh, we've got uh, another week of, of good nature to look forward to, and hopefully you'll be able to join us again next Tuesday night. I'm going to enjoy my warm beverage. It was, it was very nice. I enjoyed it a bunch. Thanks. Great to see you. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Take care, everybody. Thank you, Pam. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pam. Bye.